All right, again, welcome and thank you so much for joining us this evening. We are very excited to kick off the Camden Conference Community Events virtually at the Camden Public Library. Uh, normally we do these in the picker room at the Camden Public Library every fall and in the beginning of winter. Um, and we will be doing this on the third Tuesday of every month leading up to the conference weekend in February. So we're gonna have a little bit more information about that in just a moment. Um, my friend and Camden Conference community events uh, member, Sue Michaelovitz, will be telling you a little bit about the Camden Conference and she'll also introduce tonight's program with John Paul Caponegro. Sue, thank you. Hi everyone. On behalf of the Camden Conference and our uh, Community Events Committee, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program. We'd definitely like to thank our host, the Camden Public Library, for making these programs possible. This is the first one in our series this fall. The mission of the Camden Conference is to foster informed discourse on world issues. In keeping with our mission, we offer a series of community events leading up to our annual weekend conference. This year's conference is titled The Geopolitics of the Arctic, A Region in Peril, and will take place February 20th and 21st, live streamed to you from the historic Camden Opera House. Ticket sales for the conference for members are available now and other tickets will be available in the future. This season, the conference community event series includes library presentations on Zoom, our new favorite platform, some special events and other collaborative events. Please visit the website at www.camdenconference.org and we can put that in the chat box for more details of the conference speakers, membership, all the community events and access to the recommended readings that you can do prior to the conference. Now it's my pleasure to introduce my friend and one of my teachers and mentors, John Paul Caponegro. As it turns out, the night that was chosen tonight was not chosen to coordinate what happened a year ago today, but on this date today, I took a trip to Greenland with John Paul Caponegro and 19 other photographers. And this was the day we flew from Reykjavik into Constable Point Airport. I will use the term airport loosely. It's a mud runway that you get off a very small plane and walk a mile to get on a Zodiac, then to go on to a ship. So many of you on here tonight know John Paul, also known as JP or John. And JP is a visual artist who's worked in alternative process mediums, digital mediums, has most recently started to study and write poetry. And tonight he's going to discuss with you the, experience that he, the experiences he's had in Greenland and also do some compare and contrast to some of the trips he's taken to Antarctica. JP lives in Cushing, Maine and teaches courses locally and all over the world. Pleased to have you here tonight, JP. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. And thank you everyone for, for joining us tonight. Um, can you hear me well? All good? Great. Thanks to the Canberra Conference and also uh, for putting a spotlight on a really important part of the world. And I look forward to the future presentations and the more of those uh, sessions as they come up. Um, I think we all get a sense of how important the Arctic and Antarctic are, particularly in the in light of climate change. Um, I'll mention a couple of milestones, but uh, one I'd, I'd mentioned twice has kind of shook my world. I, I know it's been an eerie week with all of these California wildfires, wildfires in the West. Um, but a couple of weeks ago, we got the information that uh, scientists now think that the uh, glaciers on Greenland have kind of passed a point of no return, that there's so much energy in the system that they, they will retreat. Um, sure, ice has come and gone, but uh, we're, we're living in uh, a time of unprecedented change. And uh, I think Greenland is becoming more and more a, uh, well, the Arctic in general is becoming more and more of a focal point. Um, never mind the earlier headlines about potentially purchasing Greenland <laughs> earlier this year. Uh, I think what's more interesting is, is the cultures and how they navigate through this and uh, the pressure that uh, is put to uh, mine the resources that are in Greenland as well as how to, to manage our natural resources and, and what that means for um, the currents in our oceans. 
it's a, it's a pretty complex layered thing. And so um, I wanted to give you a little sense of, of my adventure stories of discovering it, uh, what it took to get me there and the kinds of discoveries I made, but also my artistic response to the place. Um, there are a lot of different ways to look at and respond to uh, a really rich and wonderful place. So I've been going to uh, the Arctic. Uh, if you include Iceland as part of the Arctic, and, and they do, uh, since 2008 or earlier, and Antarctica since 2005. And it's been interesting to, to go to both. I'm going to focus a little bit more on Greenland and uh, the Arctic there uh, than I am on Antarctica. But I don't think you can talk about one without the other. And I'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, it's quite interesting to think about how you get there. My first trip. We actually flew into Oslo before taking a long flight up to uh, the north of Norway and then up to Svalbard. Uh, Svalbard and Longyearbyen, this, this whole area is quite fascinating. We're very close to the Arctic Circle at this point. Picked up a boat, explored some of the islands, moved across the ocean there. I think what's deceptive about this map is that what you don't see is the extent of the sea ice. And that's really important for understanding what Greenland is, the history of it, and, and how it develops. Most of the area that you would see, this straight line, may actually be a little bit too straight. And we may have had to bend down a little bit, given the current ice conditions. The northeast of Greenland has always been very remote. There's never been any permanent settlements in this northeast area, in part because of the sea ice, making it so hard to, to hunt, to fish, to get access to that entire region. So we're really skimming the edge of the ice pack and, and at, at minimum descent or extent uh, because of the, that summer melt. So we were able to get into some of the national parks that are far up there and then finally wind our way down into Scoresbyson, which is really one of my favorite places on the planet. Just divinely beautiful. And um, these places hold a specific place in, in my heart, a very special place in my heart. They, they, they really connect us deeply. I'll share a little bit more about that as I share the, my responses to my images. I, I'd say my art comes out of a response to these transcendent places and these transcendent moments of beauty. So this little area is a place that I'll, I'll, I'll continue kind of coming back to. Then having explored Scoresby Sun, which is the largest ice fjord in the world, there are six different glaciers that come in and feed this, glaciers being ice rivers. And this massive glacier is miles wide. Uh, sorry, massive fjord is system is miles wide. And, and you literally get icebergs the size of uh, housing complexes, even skyscrapers passing through this. So there's, there's this immense volume of ice coming off the Greenland ice cap, which is one of the largest land-based ice caps. It's second only to Antarctica. I'll repeat this again. If Greenland is 8%, Antarctica is over 80%. Uh, it, it's incredible to think about just how much ice is grounded, and that's important. It's not just sea ice that's out in the water. It's ice that's on the land, and that once melted, it starts to raise sea level. That's why one of the thing, that's one of the things that uh, people are concerned about this ice sheet for, because it will raise, uh, if it melts, it will raise sea levels um, 20 feet. That's Greenland. So do the math. If Antarctica is 80%, then we're looking at 200 feet. But it's going to take a really long time to melt that much ice. This sheet is going fast, and it's quite fascinating. If any of you have seen Chasing Ice, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't seen James Balog's Chasing Ice, it's a seminal movie on uh, those kinds of climactic changes, and, uh, and really a kind of a pivotal point in, in the history of photography as well, for those who are interested in the medium and its social consequences. So from there, we, we wind our way back to Iceland and back home. Iceland seems to be this crossroads from getting from Europe to America, a lot of people will actually know having seen Greenland out the window of their airplane as they're flying over for a connection into Europe. Uh, I think that's the way that most people actually see Greenland, but I've actually uh, had the privilege of, of getting there and, and, and putting boots on the ground. Many of the trips that I've made have been on uh, expedition vessels like this. These are small cruise ships that can, this one in particular holds 75 people. Uh, we're generally small groups within that. We're about 18 to 20 people within that. So there are other people with different interests. Uh, we have this uh, obsession with ice, and we spend a lot of time in Zodiacs. Uh, you know, the cabins and the libraries and uh, dining rooms are, are quite um, 
I wouldn't say exactly spacious, but they are quite plush in, in comparison to the, what the early explorers used to have to go through. This is, this is pretty cushy with all of the amenities, the bars, the hot chocolate, the, it's a nice way to go there. This is uh, on our first journey from Svalbard through the sea ice. And, and what's really impressive is the guides, the expedition guides, who are not part of the, the people who maintain these ships, are trained to look for these tiny little yellow dots that might turn into this. And we were lucky to find ice uh, polar bears way out in the ice pack. And, and that ice pack, the sea ice, is something that's very important for polar bears to be able to uh, uh, hunt and survive through all of this. And of course, the seasonal changes are, are what create their rhythms up and down the East Coast. This is a, a big female that had uh, enjoyed quite a dinner and she was so heavy that she, with food, that she just didn't want to move. And, and the captain was amazing. He shifted the boat very, very slowly, almost incrementally, you know, less than a mile an hour, just slowly drifted up to her. And she just couldn't be bothered to move. It was quite extraordinary to see this apex predator and see this immense chunk of steel with all of these chattering photographers and a million lenses going click, click, click. And she just wasn't really that concerned. It was, it was really quite fascinating. That's probably the closest I've been to a polar bear, except for, you know, jumping into a, uh, a tourist shop in Reykjavik. Once in a while, they drift down on icebergs. And because they might at that point be diseased, they, they, ha they have to... Uh, do them in. So you'll find a couple of polar bears scattered around Iceland that are um, now looking at us. Uh, the second trip was coming out of, uh, actually, from Ottawa. We flew into Kangerlussak, this tiny little airstrip. As Sue was mentioning, the one in Scoresby or Constable Point is just a dirt strip. This was a little bit more improved than that, but, but not a lot. Way up a fjord, and then we pick up a boat. We jump on a little Zodiacs, rubber boats, get onto the larger ship, cruised up north as far as Ekipsermia, and uh, then back down the coast, past Ilulisat. Ilulisat is where uh, James Palox filmed that immense calving of the glacier. Uh, it's a wonderful ice fjord, and actually you can fly from, green, from Iceland to many small points. Ilulisat is, is an amazing ice fjord, again, very rapidly changing, very rapidly moving, one of the more active ice fields. We were able to continue down around the, the southern point. So the comparison between the east coast and the west coast is, is quite striking. There are very few settlements on the east coast. Skorsvisen, or what is now called Itakortormit. Yeah, I know my Iceland, my uh, Greenlandic is not that good. But um, it's one of the few towns along this ice-laden side. But there are many smaller towns dotted along the west side, including the capital, Nuuk, which is about 17,000, maybe 17,500 people, in contrast to Scoresby Sons. Well, it used to be 500, now it's about 350. It's, it's shrinking, as are many of these towns. I mentioned that, but there's this, uh, this diminishing population as more and more of the Greenlanders are going to Denmark, getting the education, looking for some kind of subsistence as their uh, livelihood changes with changes in hunting and fishing regulations. But I, I think it's important also to remember that their, their lifestyle has been one of constant change. The uh, other two trips coming out of Iceland, the north of Iceland, Husavik, a, a whaling town that's now a popular tourist destination. And you go out on these wooden whaling boats. Instead of going whaling, you go and tour looking for, for fins breaching the water. That's great. Up into the, again, the, there's, a there's a great national park up here and then around in Scoresby. So you can see this this developing obsession with Scoresby Sun, which happened once again with two flights into it as well. And I'll share that real quickly. Now, the last two trips, and that's what Sue was talking about, we're able to fly out of Iceland directly into Constable Point. There's this tiny little airport, believe it or not, no tarmac, just um, really hardly packed dirt, which uh, because it was so wet the last time that Sue and I were there, uh, we actually were delayed in, in landing because they, they well departing because they, they couldn't land the plane. It was so muddy. So there, there are seasonal things that are happening in these longer changes. They may need to do some improvements or, or, or do away with the airport. It'd be interesting to see what they do with this, this developing population. But again, here's a better sense of getting into Scoresby Send. You can see all of these different glaciers coming in here down Ofjord, down Gasfjord, down Vest Fjord, and of course, one of my favorite places, there's this little tiny road fjord. This is this long channel here where the cliffs are so full of iron that they look red. They're this beautiful burnt sienna, russet red, and the contrast of the whites and blues of the icebergs against those red cliffs are extraordinary. 
And if you get a calm day around this island that chokes a lot of these icebergs, it almost looks like a, a Noguchi sculpture garden. It's absolutely extraordinary. And I'll show you some images that we were able to capture from there. There's our second trip. So you can see there the, the usual suspects here, but these, these areas in particular are, are chock full of ice and absolutely stunningly beautiful. Uh, this is a view coming into uh, Council Point over that. Uh, not dissimilar from what you might see if you were on a commercial airliner and you were on the, re on the, on the correct side of the plane. Yeah. Um, I actually try and choose a seat on the side of the plane when I'm flying up to, um, say, uh, Schiffel. Uh, just make sure that I get a, a glimpse of that if there isn't too much cloud cover. Uh, absolutely stunningly beautiful to look at it. One of the things you might notice is all, all the uh, bare ground. Uh, for someone who's been down to Antarctica, that's one of the big differences. Antarctica is 98% covered in ice, where Greenland has much more exposed land. And, and again, that's uh, changing rapidly as well. More and more of it is, is changing. So it, it has a different character different routes that you can get around to these small little towns. Remember, this is the capital of 17,500, and then all of these are, you know, a thousand maybe. Uh, Constable Point is, uh, again, 350 folks. This is the tiny little boat that uh, Sue, and Peter's here as well. Peter was on that, I think. Um, we were all on that. He was actually there for his birthday, which is coming up. Happy birthday, Peter. <laughs> uh, it was really amazing to be able to go through these fjords in a retrofitted uh, early fishing boat built at the turn of last century, early 1900s, beautiful wooden boat, and to uh, be able to raise the sails and set sail. Uh, really quite fascinating. We were there late in the season, and I believe that the last cruise ship, which is actually the other one that I had been through, had exited the fjord on one of these trips, and we were the only boat for hundreds of miles. Quite interesting to be very isolated in a, in a less than ice hardened ship. They had to be careful of the ice conditions, make sure they didn't get frozen in overnight. There was, there was a real sense of adventure. And what was curious to me is in Antarctica, there are always other boats around. They try and keep them out of sight, but you know that over the horizon, there's, there's always somebody around there. Where in this case, it, it, it felt like even though the airplanes were going over, that it would take quite a bit longer for us to get to somebody or somebody to get to us. It was a very interesting sense of being really out there on the edge, remote. Little cabins that we're in, what we retreat to after several hours in Zodiacs, getting wet, getting cold, it's great fun, and then come back in and warm up. Of course, the bar is always the favorite place. And the, and the dining room, where we do our presentations. Quite a lot of fun. This, this is where most of the the riotous fun happens where we get far too close to icebergs, where we're able to uh, depart from the ship and get into areas that uh, might be too isolated for the ships to go, or that uh, we would want to spend more time. Uh, I know some of our students joke with other passengers on boats, uh, and if we're on a larger one that, uh, um, well, the, the others just can't believe how much time we spend with these beautiful blue jewels that are floating in the ocean. Uh, they're, they're really quite extraordinary. And like snowflakes, no two alike and constantly changing. So you might come back to the same iceberg the next morning and it's in a completely different state. And in fact, you might be there and it might roll or crack and bust apart. The sounds of the ice are extraordinary, whether it's the sheet ice or whether it's the icebergs or the interaction of the two. There, there's a music to ice that's really quite extraordinary. Uh, so it's a rare opportunity to uh, get out there and get wild. I'm going to focus in on this little tiny town, Itakortormit, or because Arthur Meyerson, another great photographer, uh, couldn't pronounce it in his Texan accent, he decided to call it Itakormit. <laughs> Itakortormit is uh, one of the few villages on the East Coast, but it has a very interesting history. It's only been around since 1925, and it has a very specific political function, but it is uh, a curious portrait of what's happening with Inuit culture. I'll give you a little tour of the, of the town, show you the, uh, the local curator, uh, soon to be sheriff, or at least that's what he hopes. Uh, Itakortormit means big house dwellers. And that's kind of interesting, uh, understanding that you know, the Inuit, like the Native Americans, are this collection of many different tribes. And similar to the African tribes, there are linguistic similarities that allow different tribes to be able to communicate with one another very easily. But it would be a mistake to consider 
all, all of uh, those different tribes of exactly the same culture. Um, there's, there's something shared and there's something also quite unique about each individual thing. And it, they've been around for millennia as they've constantly been circling the North Pole. Very few of them actually get to the North Pole. In fact, uh, I believe um, Anau Kajinga is the name that they, that one tribe came up with as they were trying to guide people, uh, Westerners, to the North Pole, a place that they had never been. Anau Kajinga means the crown of the uh, earth. I'm kind of quite fascinating to think of it. This little town was established in 1925 by Denmark, and the reason is Denmark wanted to be able to maintain their claims throughout most of the Northeast. There was a, a, a um, let's just say a vying between some of the other Scandinavian countries for this territory. And so they wanted to establish a town to establish the legitimacy of that. Uh, Greenland is still a protector of Denmark. And there's, uh, there is an independence movement, but it's uh, fairly civil. Denmark is uh, working with uh, the Greenlanders quite cordially. Um, they would be fine with them exiting and making their own, but the Greenlanders also know that they are not able to develop their resources and their economy in, in the current Western situation to be able to do it on their own yet. Uh, closest town to Iceland, probably one of the reasons why we fly into it. The economy is hunting, but uh, not fishing, which is surprising because there's a lot of shrimp, there's a lot of halibut in the area, but it's under the sea ice, and the sea ice that's up and around the corner makes it hard to get at these resources. So interesting to think about this Western settlement for Western reasons, relocating this tribe, this small town of uh, indigenous people uh, for Western reasons. And they're trying to do a subsistence that, you know, people for millennia have really just sort of passed through and, and not settled. And you can see in 1925, there were about 80 people uh, it really spiked in about 2006, and uh, it's been dwindling rapidly. I think since 2006, they've lost about 17% of the population, and this this continues. But it's not a uh, an isolated story, and just like many of the reservations in North America, there are issues of poverty, alcoholism, uh, other issues. Are there enough op economic opportunities? Plus, also there's the the pull of the West. Um, and this is just the tiny little town. It's a gorgeous little thing with these fun colors on these very Danish buildings. You can see modern equipment here. People are buzzing around on four wheelers, uh, waiting for the snow to come for when they'll actually use the sled dogs. It's quite a sled dog town, but they're actually having a hard time feeding the sled dogs. So they're starting to reduce the population of the sled dogs at this point. The sled dogs are absolutely some of my favorites. I love getting uh, covered in mud by the puppies. They're, they're a really wonderful breed. This is Nuke, probably the largest, uh, well, it is the largest city. And you can see there are some industrial areas as well. They want to call it the Rainbow City because of the similar multicolored quality of the, of the town. But uh, there are definitely skyscrapers, high rises, oil tanks, uh, modern harbors. You know, they're, they're, they're trying to industrialize and it's, uh, it's a full on city. Um, but again, less than 18,000 people. This is the uh, local curator of the museum in Itacorvermit. <laughs> I'm not sure if he's over 20, but he's got high ambitions to become the sheriff of the place. So when I was talking with him, this was several years ago, he was planning on finishing his education in Denmark and then returning. He says, I'm going to be sheriff. In the meantime, he's running this tiny little museum and has done this uh, beautiful job putting together an exhibition of photographs of the place, old photographs, scanned, printed out as co color laser copies. Of course, they're black and white images, but they're warm tone color laser copies very uh, elegantly displayed with scotch tape. And I gotta say that, you know, as rudimentary as this was, it was one of the most interesting uh, exhibitions of photography that I've, I've seen, uh, period. Uh, never mind that it, it wasn't perfectly presented. It, it seemed to come out of the fabric of the community. It was a very interesting window. It was curated by the community, but many of these images were made by Westerners. Uh, and, and this is kind of a tie into their sense of the development of their community, which is just one little chapter in the development of their culture. And so for this kid to have one foot in both worlds, these, these people, when they, they can interface with both cultures, are I find just fascinating. Uh, he also introduced me to uh, Inuit death metal. There is such a thing. <laughs> uh, it doesn't sound a whole lot better than regular death metal, or, or maybe it sounds just as good as regular death metal, depending on your point of view. Uh, but it's very interesting to see them absorbing the, the contemporary influences and going to the local grocery store and see them 
um, buying their DVDs of the latest Hollywood movies and, uh, and, and not only playing you know, their traditional songs, but also incorporating some of that into, into very contemporary art forms as well. So I took a whole lot of shots of those, went around the town. At that point, the, on this particular visit, um, Cream Peas had, had uh, showed up and uh, there was a little scuffle between them and the town. It was kind of interesting to see them cordially navigate all of that and uh, layered it together with uh, the old kayak club. Uh, the, the Greenlanders are amazing kayakers and the development of that uh, form. And uh, they continue that today. So this is an old, old version. Uh, one of the first boats when the town was first set up. You know, one of the current houses today. Sled dogs, then and now. Uh, they're, they're really scrappy kind of Malamute Husky types, so they're quite different. They've got a really rough fur. They're, um, shall we say, opinionated, stubborn. Um, you know, once they get to be working dogs, uh, yeah, you have to treat them kind of carefully. But uh, I, I'm a dog lover, and uh, uh, I, I find them endlessly fascinating, including the social order within, within the packs and how that shifts. Very interesting to see the church, which was more of a tourist uh, destination than it was something that was used by the locals, though the locals, some of the locals do show up on Sundays, and, and to see the old images of when they first started building those. Interesting to see all these little sleds built out of plywood, um, waiting for the snow to come. And then the ladders, you can see the ladders on the sides of the buildings, wait, oh, again, waiting for the snows to come, another way to get out the window if there's, there's too much snow around. So you get a, you get a sense of the, of the change and know that you know, we're there in their summer and there's quite different in the winter. Very, very interesting sense of culture on the edge of change, will it survive? but also a sense of the transition that an earlier, much more primal culture has come to this and, and maybe transitioning away from this into something else isn't, it isn't tragic in, in any sense of the word, because how do you navigate that change in a way that uh, lets them celebrate and preserve the aspects of their culture, which are vital to them, but not necessarily be settled in Western ways. Kids are always adorable. A lot, a lot, a lot of fun. I'm contrasting this really quickly with images that I did the very same thing. I started in Greenland, but when I went down to Antarctica, I realized, I wonder if I can extend this. And so I'm doing this with shots from Deception Island, which is an old whaling station, a very interesting place. It's inside an active volcano and then some historic shots. And of course, these are Westerners documenting their history. Uh, whales coming out of uh, holes in the ice, colonies of penguins. Of course, you get polar bears in the north and penguins down south, and the two don't meet except for in commercials or movies. Uh, these abandoned whaling tanks where they used to process the whales. This is a very eerie place, not only because it's still an active volcano and you've sailed into it and you can see it steaming, but also because there literally, literally used to be bloodbaths here where the West was using uh, these natural resources in less than conscientious ways. But that has stopped. and. Uh, Species like the humpback whale are springing back in, in a big way. Love some of these early cameras to kind of document what was going on. And so we're, we're looking at, at kind of the edges of contemporary history because obviously dialed back and we don't have photographs. So how do we understand those places through stories, through what's written? Can you imagine being down there without the lifeline when there weren't other boats out there, when there was no GPS, there were no satellite phones, uh, these guys were out there, and boy, were they rugged. Wow. You can see this place has got a lot of ground cover, and that's because, again, we're in the middle of a, a volcano. This is unusual to see this much ground in Antarctica. <laughs> Early RCA, I suppose. I wonder what, they, what music they were playing for the sled dogs. And I'm wondering if the, the same sled dogs are up north. I have a feeling they were because many of those explorers were in both places. This is the caldera. We're looking at uh, Deception Island where you can sail through Neptune's bellows to get into the beach here down in the south. Uh, literally, the rest of the place steams and there are times where they uh, put people on alert. It's a fascinating little island down in the South Shetlands as you approach the Antarctic Peninsula, which is where the vast majority of tourists to Antarctica visit. Uh, the area with a long history of, of Western exploration and no history of an indigenous culture. It's one of the very interesting things. The Arctic has had 
a long, long history of culture, way back prehistory, and the Antarctic has uh, never had an indigenous culture there, and it's now an international area of dedicated to science. Um, you'll see, get a sense of just how covered in snow it is. Again, 95, 98% covered in snow, these massive glaciers. Uh, and yes, there is some melting going on there. Uh, some of the ice sheets destabilizing, and some changes in the sea ice. But once again, there is so much ice and the place is so massive. It's the seventh continent. Um, it, it, it is the largest freshwater body of, body of fresh water containing 90% uh, of the world's ice. <laughs> Uh, it's it's a place of staggering staggering contrasts. So it's very different being in Greenland, where you can see the mountains, the land, set foot on it, and uh, where in Antarctica it's it's hard to find a place to put your foot on solid ground, except for the edges of islands where the where the snow has melted. Uh, or Greenland, on the other hand, you can see the contrails coming over uh, head, and you get a sense of being. In, in the presence of man, and that there has been a culture there for quite some time, and that there are both ancient and contemporary cultures, where in Antarctica, there's none of that. There's just scientific bases, uh, and, and a few of those at that. Very interesting to look at the physical structure of the place. Antarctica is a continent down at the bottom of the Earth, or the, depending on your perspective, the southern part of the Earth, surrounded by ice, with this immense ice cap on it. Where the Arctic, I've been looking at Greenland in particular, I've mentioned Iceland, but the Arctic up here really is just is this open area of flat sea ice, several meters thick. And both of these sea ice areas oscillate. It's very interesting to look at their summer and winter extents. And if you see animations of their seasonal changes, it almost feels like the earth is, is breathing. You can see these, these changes over time. Um, but those are the very things that, that melt of cold water from the Antarctic and from the Arctic and the transfer of all of that energy through the ocean is part of what drives climate. It, these giant currents moving through the earth of the cold bottom water from Antarctica drifting slowly northward, this warmer water finally waking its way down. You can see these are the current, uh, current currents or the contemporary currents, uh, obviously is over, over geologic time, those things have shifted quite a bit. Uh, so it's a fascinating little place and it's useful to think about its impact on uh, climate. And I'm not going to talk a great deal about climate change, which is one of my favorite subjects, but I'm going to mention this very quickly, global warming. 97% of scientists agree it's a fact. Yeah, there's some debate about just how much humans contribute, but there's very little debate that we do contribute. And it's been very interesting speaking to scientists talking about how they are inherently conservative. They want to stick to the facts, the current data, and they don't want to jump to conclusions. And there's some real concern among the scientific community that they haven't messaged their information effectively enough to raise the kind of concern that is warranted. And that uh, as the data piles up and things start moving faster, uh, all of their models need to be rewritten um, almost on an annual basis these days. So one of the questions is, is how do we live in balance on this beautiful blue marble spaceship Earth? If you look at the, uh, the data on, on carbon alone, you can see that we're in this period, this era of industrialization, and that if you go back 800,000, even if you go several million years back, we've, we've not been at this level for a long time. Of course, there's a strict correl clear correlation between carbon and temperature, but there are other greenhouse gases. And one of the things I think makes the Arctic so significant, and when I talk about the Arctic, I'm talking about Northern Canada, I'm talking about Russia, I'm talking about Northern China, I'm talking about any place that has sequestered a lot of methane, uh, not just carbon, into the tundra. And as the tundra is melting and releasing that uh, methane, methane is more than eight times more greenhouse effective than carbon dioxide. So while we're producing a lot of carbon dioxide and as we're burning off some of the gas, we're making methane, our cows are making methane, What's stored up in the Arctic uh, is a huge concern, and, and we're fast racing towards a tipping point. So Gore's little red line that's been going up so straight, well, you might as well draw it straight up if, if that stuff starts to really melt. It started, but um, it's, it's starting to tip in a very uh, concerning way, so we say that. So the oceans are getting hotter. The whole world's getting hotter. Uh, you know, 18 out of the 19 hottest years on record um, in the last 20 years. Um, so 
It's interesting to take a look at the extent of the summer sea ice in the Arctic from 1990 to 2015. So that's a 25 year phase. And you can see that uh, the extent is much smaller. But one of the interesting things that scientists discovered was that the ice is actually thinning. This is something that satellites didn't pick up because they were looking at extents like this, but until they actually used sound to test the thickness of the ice, then they started to see there was also melting from underneath and think thinner, not just smaller in extent. Uh, this is one of the reasons why Russia and China and so many others are vying for those shipping lanes because it's going to be easier to get uh, materials shipped from continent to continent, from point to point, uh, when there's less sea ice, uh, certainly in the summer. Uh, and these are some of the projections about where we might end up in another 100 years. Um, <laughs> some cause for concern, but I'm not going to stick on that too long. I want to... Uh, move on to some of the areas. I just, I think it's important to highlight how important those places are for preserving, uh, so we say the habitability of our environment and, and how it's important to understand that the changes in those areas uh, will very definitely change things for us. Uh, last thing I'm gonna do there, no. Yeah, I know, go away. Thanks. Article. You know, if it all melts, just remember Greenland, 8%, Antarctica, 80%, kind of a 10 to 1 factor. Greenland, 20 feet of sea level rise. Antarctica, 200 level feet of sea rise. Remember, 200 feet of sea rise, melting all the Ant Antarctic ice, that's going to take centuries. Uh, we're, we're not talking about overnight, uh, but we are starting to see rapid movement in, in Greenland. Uh, and, and these kinds of projections where we've really only seen an inch roughly in the last 50 years, we're anticipating six feet in the next 100. So you can imagine what that will do to coastlines. Uh, National Geographic did these kinds of graphics showing how the United States and South America and Europe might be redrawn. You can see all of these areas, Africa, particularly in the West, in a big significant area, uh, a lot of uh, Asia, uh, with, with people living along the floodplain. We're talking about hundreds of millions of people being displaced over the next 100 to 300 years. So just get ready for mass migration. Uh, I'm not sure this is gonna happen in, in our lifetime, <laughs> but it is a, 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 a visualization of um, you know, some of the concerns there. And the main concern is disrupting ways of life, massive changes uh, in the way that we build cities, in, in the movement of peoples uh, throughout the world. Uh, all because of, of this ice, and north and the south is where our cryosphere is. Hmm. The north is also, and they're both north and south, but it's very hard to see, uh, well, these things, auroras down south. Uh, there's an auroral oval that is just north of Iceland. It's basically a, a little torus or a donut that goes around the earth, and anywhere along that auroral oval increases the chances of all that that magnetic radiation coming off the sun, funneling down through the magnetosphere and producing these incredible, incredible colors. Um, these nights, this one in, in Iceland, actually, um, it was like somebody was playing with a rheostat. And you'll see this in scores we send, you'll see this a lot uh, throughout Greenland, a lot in the Arctic regions. Uh, they're absolutely divine. And, and what these still pictures don't capture is, is the way that they dance uh, the Inuit used to think that they were spirits of ancestors uh, speaking. There are all kinds of wonderful stories about them. Uh, just visually, it's, they're absolutely extraordinary. And, and to think about how this whole thing works, how the solar winds come off and change the magnetosphere going around the Earth, and they filter these ions in and create these incredible dances, mostly green, sometimes a little red and purple, depending on the nitrogen-oxygen balance. Uh, it is simply glorious. I mean, absolutely stunning. And, and you come to places like this that are so stunningly beautiful and you get a different sense of what it's like to be on planet Earth. Uh, absolutely extraordinary. Uh, so I wanna show you a few things uh, from my series Constellation. That sense of the night sky has, has really permeated uh, my experience of the Arctic. Uh, I find it a lot harder to 
see night skies and stars in the Antarctic, uh, probably because of the times that I go. We generally go down during the summer, and uh, if you pass the Arctic Cir Antarctic Circle uh, around that time, uh, there, there really isn't much night. If there is, it, it's a faint twilight. But in the Arctic, uh, particularly in Iceland, parts of Greenland where you can get to it during the winter, uh, you, you really get a sense of, of your place in the universe and that it is much greater than just one point on this really substantial, beautiful blue marble, but there's this, this sense of, of infinity and the sense of connection to it. So I think that might have something to do with my uh, constantly tracking the movement of, of the sun. And at a, at a certain point, I started to render stars in uh, my images as if you could see through the sky to the stars that are behind them. You know, we know that there's there are stars behind the blue sky, but we often don't, we don't experience that directly. We often don't think about it until they come out at night. And I'm constantly trying to push myself and say, okay, behind every surface, there's something else. And so I'm taking night shots and layering them together with uh, compositions drawn. In this case, this is way up Ofjord in uh, Scoresbyson. Uh, a sense of poetry, a sense of connection, a sense of how interconnected everything is. You know, Carl Sagan says we're all star stuff. And uh, it's a sense of trying to get back to that. And, and, and a sense of, of different times. Every time that we look up at the night sky, we're looking back in time. Many of the things that we're now receiving light from don't exist or they're in a different state. And in many ways, so are, so are these photographs. You look at these icebergs and they're, they're long gone. They might've been shot last year or a couple of years ago, but they've melted, they've changed into something else. So photographs always are a window back in time. We use them to try and get a sense of where we are, who we are, our place in the universe, what's actually happened, make records of all of that. But uh, I think it's actually the, the act of making a photograph, of going to a place or meeting someone, of being at a particular moment in time and having that experience and, and needing to be very present in order to catch that moment. That uh, it's that, that experience of photography that is immediate. It's the making of the photograph, not the photograph itself that is, that is so here and now. These are all images shot from uh, the Hubble telescope. And I think if anyone has uh, been looking at many of the images in the media, uh, maybe some of you are as interested in the nice guys I am, and, and you've been keeping up with what the images that the Hubble has been beaming back from deeper and deeper into space and all the discoveries that are being made, different black holes colliding recently, um, fascinating things that kind of change our sense of, of how this all came to be and, and where we might be going. Those are some of the questions that inform my thinking and feeling as, as I'm making images like this. Uh, interesting also to think about uh, using images that uh, you just couldn't make without technology. These all, the foregrounds are from Scoresbyson. And of course, that's a, a deep look into space. It wouldn't be to scale, of course. deliberately falling silent there because silence is one of the penetrating things about these wild remote places. They're never truly silent because there's always this music of ice. There's this sense of wind. Uh, but these, these moments of, of quiet, of, of immense silence, you, know, you don't hear the electric lines going overhead. Your phone, you don't have reception. Uh, there are fewer calls. Uh, and, and to be able to have these moments of Intense silence are really wonderful. I know that when I'm out in these zodiacs guiding the folks who are out there in these photography workshops with me, I always look for a few moments where we can just cut the engines and drift. And I ask, you know, like, no shutters clicking, please. Let's just listen to ourselves breathing. Let's just listen to the ice melting. Let's just listen to the sound of the wind. Let's just fully absorb this place. 
when you when you come across places that are just this dazzlingly beautiful, they, they really change your breathing. They they bring you into a different state. Uh, I find this immense gratitude, this sense of wonder for being a part of it all, and that that this could even happen, uh, that, that we could even happen. It's it's really quite extraordinary if you just let it into your heart. And then we try and grapple for some poetic response, whether it's in words or whether it's in pictures or any other uh, thing. I know that several of my students have made sculptures after the fact, but just having the experience of being in this very fragile, very ephemeral, constantly changing, exquisitely beautiful, deeply connected place. Um, I, I think above all that that's part of the reason that I go there to connect to the similar things within myself to, to just experience how wonderful the world uh, can be. And I'm going to pause there because I think Sue might have some questions. I'd like to remind everyone that there is a chat box off on the right. If you have questions or comments that I can uh, give to JP, that would be great. Uh, JP, I'm gonna start with a question. Uh, when you, you've been to Greenland eight times? Is that how many times you've been there? I Seven can't remember whether it's, times. yeah, let's call it eight, yep. So when we were there last September, the weather ranged from absolutely beautiful sunshine where we had to take some of our multiple layers off to rain and fog, to snow, to heavy winds, and it could change within a half a day or moments. Have, what types of changes, because I know you've been there in similar times, what types of changes have you seen over the years that you've been there in weather? Changes in weather? Or climate. Climate, yeah. Um, I, I get a sense of that and in terms of uh, the records that are set. Uh, two summers ago, they had a record high. I think it was in the high 80s or early or low 90s down at the southern tip of Greenland. You know, not my direct experience. I, you know, I've only been there eight times and I haven't lived there. Like people that have been there for science, they've been planted there for years or like the, the Inuit who have been there for their entire life. I, th I think it's really important to look, reach out to the scientific community and see what's happening. Um, sense of how I see climate change, it's the displacement of communities, it's the recession of glaciers, glaciers that I've seen move pretty significantly, it's the change of bird colonies in uh, Antarctica, it's getting to little islands where there were bird colonies and glaciers and neither are there now. They've, they've moved south and the ice is, has gone out to sea. Um, it, it, there is a general warming trend, but at the end, you have, to, you have to be careful about your own individual uh, experiences and say, there you know, could be seasonal variation. We, we just happen to have a really warm summer. Or, you know, I can say that I have witnessed many things uh, and had personal experiences, but I also want to lean on, on the scientists to see the, the larger general trends. Um, another question that's come in, and it's a very good question for you in particular, uh, something that I didn't mention in your intro is that you're a member of the Photoshop Hall of Fame. I know you've been involved in Photoshop and testing and, and um, working with them for a number of years. And the question is, can you share your favorite post-processing steps for your night reflection shots? And are there any software filters that you use for this? Uh, we're talking about layering the constellations on the. I believe uh, so. Yeah, yeah. Th that that is. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think about how I can joke about just how simple that is. That's one layer put on top of another, and you change the blend mode to either screen or lighten, and then maybe adjust the contrast of the thing, and that's it. <laughs> so it's much more about concept and it's about finding the right transparency, the right contrast, than it is about any fancy masking or any fancy filter or any fancy tool. It's, it's really very simple compositing and then a, a delicate sense of balance. Yes, yeah. and I can say that you call simple compositing for many of us is not simple. 
because you've done it for so many years. Um, okay, well, let, me, <laughs> let me count the steps. Number one, drag and drop, step mm -hmm. one, drag and drop. If you want, number two, reposition. Number three, change the blend mode to screen. Number four, change the opacity slider. Four little sl steps. And that's it. I think what makes Photoshop so challenging is that there are a thousand little buttons and a thousand little menu items, and it's for six different types of people. You know, it's for photographers and designers and videographers, and there's so much there. But if you actually go in and find the core pieces that are built for photographers and the things that they use again and again and again, and forget about everything else, then Photoshop really becomes manageable. I think in order to master Photoshop, you have to first figure out what 80% to forget about. So I also think if you're in a place like Greenland, the light and the colors are just so dramatic that um, it doesn't really take a lot to make them look really, really good. <laughs> and you still, have, you still have your camera. You still need to do a little post. And you, and you still need to pre-visualize and imagine, well, maybe the light's not perfect here, but what could it be? Yeah, so. So next question. Have you visited either polar region in the winter? No. Um, I have visited Iceland in the winter, and um, wow, talk about fierce weather. Um, winds that'll blow you off your feet and snowdrifts that'll shut down the whole country. Um, but I have not been uh, up to Greenland in the dead of winter or in Antarctica, which would be, you know, now or six weeks ago. Uh, you know, once again, can you imagine Antarctica, the coldest, the highest, driest, windiest, coldest place on the planet below the antarctic circle you've got six months of darkness and it might be 100 mile an hour wind and it could be up to 100 below yeah that sounds like ideal conditions for photographing <laughs> wow i mean fierce wow next questions um what do you what do you find to be help to be hopeful about our future regarding climate change You've referenced that we've crossed the point of no return in terms of melting ice. Is there something we can do individually or collectively? Uh, a perfect yeah. group of questions from a former journalist. Absolutely wonderful. Is, is that Peter Ember by any chance? Roger. It's Roger. 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 Wonderful. Okay. Um, there are a, a lot of suggestions up on my website about how to participate. Uh, let me give you one of the big um, areas of hope that I see, the cost per gigawatt of energy for renewables is dramatically smaller or lower than oil. So when you can hit them in the marketplace, when oil costs, let's just say these aren't exact numbers, but the percentages are about right. When oil costs a buck, when solar costs 75 cents, and when wind costs 50 cents, now all we're talking about is the infrastructure to deliver that. And one of the key things there is developing large enough batteries and an infrastructure to be able to store it so we can deliver on peak time. That's why a lot of the power companies are now putting these hybrid solutions, part renewable and part oil, just the oil or carbon in order to keep them going at the right times. But the market pressure to get away from fossil fuels and to get onto renewables is dramatic. And that kind of economic success story is, is very, very, very hopeful. Remember, transportation industry accounts for at least 40% of our output of carbon. So it's, it's a huge contribution if we can kick the carbon habit there. Thank you. And I have uh, one more question that's come in. And after the answer to that, uh, we have a couple closing comments. Great. JP, um, how do you reconcile traveling to these places, burning fossil fuels with your concerns about climate change? Yep buy carbon credits, right? In other words, buy the offset, whether it means planting mango trees in Thailand or wherever it happens to be. Uh, and there are better uh, places to buy carbon credits than others. And um, I think advocating, once they say that you go to Antarctica as a tourist and you return as a, an ambassador. And that has certainly been my experience and I've seen it for many of the people who travel with me. They want to share their story. They want to share the wonder of the thing. They want to advocate for it. They know how special it is. Uh, so I think it, it comes with, uh, that privilege comes also with a responsibility to, to speak out and to encourage. Uh, but also, if, if we have to get on these big boats and these airplanes, uh, buy the carbon credits at, at a very minimum. 
um, you can do all kinds of other things to, to make a difference as well. So JP, before we thank you upside down, backward and forward, um, I'd like to bring on first Matt Storen. Uh, one of the really cool things about living here in Camden is the people we get to meet. And Matt is the chair of the Camden Conference. And in his life before here, he was the editor in chief of the Boston Globe. So Matt has a couple of comments to make about the Camden Conference. Thank you, Sue. Fantastic. Um, thank you, JP, for a great perspective on this fascinating part of the world which we have chosen to examine in the 2021 conference. And thank you also Camden Public Library, as Julia, who's a member of our current uh, community events committee, and therefore one of my colleagues for hosting this. And thank you all for, for joining tonight. I just wanted to say a couple of words about the conference. I don't want to uh, belabor the point. It's, it's been a, uh, a fascinating but uh, a good hour now on uh, Zoom and everybody has their limits. I just wanted to mention a couple of things about the conference, which as Sue noted, will be February 20th and 21st, uh, all online, all live streamed. Our, um, our keynote speaker, we're very pleased to be able to announce will be Oliver Grimson, former president of Iceland and one of the world's foremost experts on the Arctic, uh, the person who formed the Arctic Circle Organization, which advocates for this region. And uh, following his talk on Saturday morning, the 20th, uh, Paul Majewski, our own Paul Majewski from the University of Maine, uh, a, a real pioneer and uh, courageous researcher in this part of the world. We'll be talking about all of the scientific value of what happens in the Arctic. Uh, if you want to find out more about other speakers, we've almost filled our program entirely. Uh, please go to camdenconference.org. All the details are there. And uh, tickets for the public will go on sale after November 30th, but anyone can join as a member at any time uh, for $150. Uh, but thank you again, Sue, for hosting this, and, for, and again, JP, for an excellent presentation. Thank you, Matt. And as I was talking to Matt in a side conversation earlier today, uh, the interesting thing about the Camden Conference this year is people can come from everywhere because it'll all be done on Zoom. That's right. Julia wanted to make some closing comments, I believe. Yes, and again, thank you, John Paul. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Matt. This was a fascinating evening. Um, I just want to really quickly mention that we'll be talking about climate change again later this week. On Thursday, September 17th at 6 p.m., we will be welcoming Dr. Jeff Wells of National Audubon. He will be doing a presentation called climate change and the decline of birds, what can we do? So if that sounds like a topic you'd be interested in, please email me at jpierce, the same, jpierce at librarycamden.org. I'm the same person who sent you the link to this program. Also, please keep your eyes on librarycamden.org to find out about more upcoming programs. We'll be doing Camden Conference community events every third Tuesday leading up until the conference weekend in February. So once again, thank you everyone. If you'd like to share this program, we'll be posting it afterwards on the Camden Public Library Program's YouTube channel by tomorrow morning. So- And, and, a, and a final thanks to JP uh, for uh, coming on with us tonight, all the way from Cushing, Maine. And, <laughs> and also, I posted the link to his website uh, in the chat box, it's johnpaulcaponegro.com. His website is like an encyclopedia of photography information. So it's something, if you are a photographer or think you might want to be a photographer or a visual artist, make sure you check out his website. Absolutely. Yeah. Good night, everyone. Good night, John Thank Paul. You. Good night, Sue. Bye, everybody.